Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we welcome you to the Gemini Solar Festival webinar of the 2025 initiative. Uh, my name is Alexander Ilchuk, and I uh, welcome you on the behalf of the coordination group of the 2025 initiative. And before we will start our work today, our meeting today, let's have um, alignment. Let's focus within our own soul. And we connect from through space with the souls of each other. all 45 people who are now present at the webinar and those who will join us as we will proceed. And we extend our connection to the worldwide web of world servers. We focus in the periphery of the great ashram, entering its sphere. And we focus on the heart center of the hierarchy, the Christ. We visualize the great triangle of Shambhala, hierarchy, and humanity. And we bring our focus back to the new group of old servers. And we read the mantra of the new group of old servers. May the power of one life pour through the group of all true servers. May the love of the one soul characterize the lives of all who seek to aid the great ones. May we fulfill our part in the one work 
through self-forgetfulness, harmlessness, and the right speech. And we bring our focus back into the field of our group today. And we begin our work. Today, uh, we have, um, as our guests, we have uh, Michael Lindfield and Nancy Seifer uh, from the United States. And... Um, I wanna, uh, want to welcome uh, Michael and Nancy. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you very much for um, joining our webinar today and taking the lead and uh, bringing our collective focus into this very important call to cooperation. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank Sasha. You. Thank you very much, Alexander. And thank you for the very powerful alignment that we began with. And what I wanted to say to, to begin this gathering, this exploration, is that each of us brings with us valuable experience and insights from the past. There are hundreds and thousands of years of, of wisdom present on this call. And this lifetime and other lifetimes. But there's something else that's available to us. In addition to this, the rich harvest of the past, we actually have an opportunity today to receive actual new insights by creating a receptive field. And so I wanted to do a very brief addition to your alignment and have us re-enter the silence that we created and to visualize ourselves now around the planet, linked heart to heart, linked to the heart of the ashram, and see the chalice that is the new group of world service being open and receptive to the overlighting wisdom, love, light, and spiritual power that is pouring into our consciousness as a group. Let's just take a moment in the silence to create the space and to call forth this blessing so that new sights may be born in the moment, in the now. So now we're ready to be impressed by the wisdom of our own overlighting soul, soul of humanity, and by the, our elder brothers and sisters who are with us today in this gathering. And the theme of today can be best summed up in some words that uh, Nancy is going to read to us. So, Nancy. Yes. Yes. Before I do that, I wanted to just greet everyone, our friends and known and unknown as yet, but all of us friends, and I wanted to share with you an experience I had when I began to prepare for this webinar. As soon as I thought about it, I felt a wave of anxiety. 
because all of my life, whenever I had to make a public presentation, I wrestled with this kind of anxiety, like so many other people, with a phobia about public speaking. But then I began to think about today's event as a gathering of souls, all of us moving together along the path of spiritual evolution, and the anxiety disappeared. As souls struggling toward greater light, we know each other well. There's no need to perform or impress as there are no barriers. I saw us as a group headed toward the same great goal and here to support each other on the journey. The destination of this journey is outlined in a beautiful passage from uh, Dinah, Discipleship in the New Age 1, for those not familiar with Dinah, which appears on your screen and which I'd like to read uh, a couple of paragraphs of. In which the Tibetan describes what it is to be part of a group of souls that is called an ashram. In the Aquarian Age, which is now so near, relatively speaking, there will be an externalization of the inner ashram upon the outer plane. Disciples, initiates, and world disciples will meet for the first time in human history as disciples, recognizing each other and recognizing the master of their group. The inner ashram is a focus of souls, free and unlimited. The outer ashram, under the future exper Aquarian experiment, will be composed of a focus of personalities and souls. Limitation will, therefore, exist. Responsibility will require conscious recognition and there will be a necessary slowing down of both action and perception in the outer space-time world. The true ashram, of which the coming outer ashrams will be but reflections, is not for lower concrete mind discussion. It is a focal point of receptivity. It embraces the effort to establish mutual contact through a united recognition of the vision of the esoteric basis of life and the laws governing action. It is not a place, however, for long and silent meditation processes, for it is a point of tension where together the ageless wisdom in its more esoteric aspects is discussed and where the nature of soul relationship is recognized and where the fusion of auras and the interblending of the triangles goes forward consciously. An ashram is the state of mind of a spiritual group. It is a point of united thought. It is a center for the clarification of the vision and not of physical plane methods of work. As disciples learn to integrate themselves into a master's ashram, they discover that the first thing they have to do is to establish a basic harmony between themselves and their fellow disciples and to reinforce the contact between their own souls, the ashramic group, and the master. Then they learn to comprehend through discussion and experiment the nature of the energies which are seeking world expression and the nature of the forces which must be reduced to powerlessness if these new incoming energies are to prove effective in bringing about the desired changes under the plan. And now Michael will begin our, our uh, introductory thoughts. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, that's the task ahead of us. That's the reality. And as you were speaking, I, I was thinking about the outer ashram. It's a blend of souls and personalities. And therefore, 
um, it will have its challenges, it will have its difficulties because that's what we're doing. Each of us in our own way is seeking to integrate and align. We're seeking to become integrated and soul-infused personalities to, to create, as it's called, the first fusion. And then that way we, we create a chalice for the inflowing energies of the higher monadic fire, which leads to the second fusion. We're familiar with that particular description of, of the two fusions. And I was thinking, as you were reading, as above, so below. If that's happening to us, that we're seeking alignment and integration at our level, what's happening at a planetary level? So here, here's a thought that, that, that um, I'd like to present. What if the planetary logos is going through a major shift in consciousness, being called by the solar logos to take another step on the path? And this process requires the integration of the planetary vehicles. Well, if the planetary vehicles are the kingdoms, the lower three and the upper three, and the human kingdom, the seven kingdoms, therefore, we are going to be part of that integration process. And as we come together in groups, and as we seek to respond in groups to the call, that is part of this great strategy of integration that is taking place within the consciousness of the planetary logos. And if, if I hold it, and if we see it from that perspective, then cooperation with the spiritual hierarchy between the fourth and the fifth kingdoms is simply a natural response to this higher call that the planetary logos is responding to from the solar logos, and so on and so on, because it's always lives within lives within lives. And in that way, it takes it out of the humanly based um, way of looking at it, and it says we're part of this living ecosystem called the planet, and it's being called together, and we're part of the calling, we're the called, <laughs> and who's the caller? And so uh, there's this wonderful thing. So the the call to closer cooperation between humanity and the kingdoms of souls is very natural. And actually, it's, it's the sign of a healthy relationship occurring within the planetary body. It's like w it, it, when I start to integrate my own emotions and to bring my mind to a point of focus and purity, I'm bringing it myself to a point of synthesis, to a point of coordination. The, planet, the planetary logos has to do the same. And we have this kingdom called humanity with its free will that is um, maybe not as yet fully aligned with the overall purpose of the planet. And that's what we're seeking to do is to align our will with a greater will. Al align our individual and group lives to a greater life. And um, so when I have this conversation, people say, well, that's all very well and good, but this is, this is ethereal. This is, this is very very up in the sky, what does it mean? And I was thinking that when we talk about cooperation with the spiritual hierarchy, there are some very real examples of this. And, and I'm thinking of one that I was privileged to be part of, which is the Findhorn community in Northeast Scotland. I lived there for about 14 years. And um, people are familiar with the experiment that went on in the early days at Findhorn between the David kingdom, the forces of nature, the elementals, and the human kingdom. This triangle uh, demonstrated what could be grown in a garden, and, and the result was these large vegetables. But the whole object of the exercise wasn't to grow large vegetables. It was to prove the reality of cooperation between these different aspects of life. One, one of the parts of the history of Finhorn that isn't as well known, is that we were also guided by the spiritual hierarchy. We were overlighted by the Lord of Civilization. The whole seventh ray impulse was flooding through the place. And uh, there were different people there, including uh, David Spangler, uh, Rock, uh, this particular overlighting stream 
and we were guided by the master R. We were guided by what we called the Comte de Saint-Germain, because in his European incarnation, Saint-Germain uh, was responsible for civilization there. So these, these very real connections inspired and gave ideas and actually fueled something that has now become recognized worldwide as a viable way of living. So what it did is that it, it helped to the partnership with hierarchy and the partnership with the David forces. Um, it, it helped to show that Finhorn was a prototype of a new civilization. It's a living example. It's not the only one. It has its, it has its challenges. But it was the result of a hierarchical or an ashramic impulse. And, and when I think of similar experiments, I think of Auroville in southern India or the Community of Living Ethics in, in Italy. There are other examples where very, very deep communication with the uh, spiritual forces leads to very real and, and, and practical outcomes. So anyway, th those are just some, some thoughts about um, what does it mean when we say closer cooperation with the spiritual hierarchy. Thank you, Michael. One of the things that we wanted to do today, Michael and I, is to try to demystify and declamorize some of the thought forms that become obstacles to cooperating with the hierarchy. And if we can do this as a group, our feeling was that we could all become more effective in serving the plan. It seems the call of our time is to begin to close the gap between the fourth and fifth kingdoms of nature. But the taboos surrounding this issue continue to obscure what is the central reality of the discipleship path, which is that the natural outcome of this path is communication with members of the spiritual kingdom in service to the plan. In 1945, the Tibetan master requested the help of disciples in carrying out a task. And he said that it was crucial for three recognitions to become rooted in the mass consciousness in order to avoid worldwide catastrophe. And these were, these, these realities that had to be recognized were the existence of the soul and of the hierarchy and of the plan. He asked disciples and aspirants to convey these realities in a way that would, quote, produce fundamental changes in human thought, human awareness, and direction. So here we are 70 years later, and we can only imagine how different our world would be if masses of people were living in the awareness that they are souls, temporarily incarnate in form, that a higher kingdom comprised of enlightened souls does actually exist, and that a divine plan is guiding the evolution of our planet. So we might ask ourselves, why has it been so difficult to carry out this task? And I wonder, could the answer be that we have to know these higher plane realities inwardly before we can convey them to others? And if that's so, then it seems our work lies in deepening the subtle relationships between our personalities and souls and between our souls and the hierarchy, so that we know through experience. The wisdom teachings tell us that every aspirant will eventually tread the path of discipleship, and that this path ultimately leads into the ashram of the Christ, and that we're guided along the way by members of the hierarchy, as well as our own souls. The process of spiritual unfoldment is as natural as the blossoming of a flower. And maybe if we could learn to see 
feel it this way and see the masters as elder brothers who trod the path before us, it might be easier for us to communicate about these things. With the new energies pouring into the planet and the thinning of the veils between visible and invisible dimensions, members of the hierarchy are increasingly making their present felt to awakened souls. Some of the messages they transmit are similar to those of the Tibetan 70 years ago, that there's an urgency about us learning to serve as conscious links in the chain of planetary hierarchies so that we can present to humanity the vision of the coming new world. DK has told us that humanity's role in the, in the Aquarian Age is to become the mediator or the bridge between the lesser and the greater kingdoms. And when we fulfill that role, there will exist an unbroken chain of consciousness from the highest to the lowest planes of awareness on our planet. And that's how, he says, the will of God will become fully manifest on our planet. We, we already see tremendous evidence of humanity, members of our species, developing closer ties with species in the animal and plant kingdoms. And now we're beginning to see members of the, the World Service Group being called to communicate with the spiritual kingdom through the aspect of ourselves closest to that kingdom, which is the soul. And we're beginning to learn what it means to live as a soul. Students of the wisdom teachings know that the soul on its own plane is a pure embodiment of light and love. Already, the soul is part of the fifth kingdom, the, the kingdom of souls. But the incarnate soul is unaware of that until we find our way to the path of return, where we are led into a conscious relationship with this higher kingdom of souls. Once we commit ourselves to this path, we are in essence being groomed by our solar angel and by the inner guides and teachers to serve the plan, which is the purpose held in the mind of God for the coming new age. As personalities, we have only one thing to do to fit ourselves for this expanded service, and that is to release everything that conceals the pure essence of the soul. All the imprisoning patterns that have clouded our self-perception over lifetimes. Our main work is to reveal the, quotes, hidden splendor of the soul by facing and dissolving everything that hides it everything that we would prefer not to see about ourselves. And that is, that is really the de-glamorizing work required to build a bridge of communication or a band of, of resonant frequencies with the ashram. Hmm. Everyone who struggles to free the lower self from karmic entanglements and personality attachments knows the terrific demands that are placed upon us in the goal of spiritual liberation. Treading the path of self-perfection that leads into the kingdom of souls could be deemed anything but glamorous. The call to sacrifice grows increasingly louder, as does the demand for expanded responsibility. But everyone who answers the call knows that the rewards are great in terms of opportunities to serve. And never has there been such a need for us to serve as now, when the world we've always known <laughs> is falling apart. We are the keepers of the flame of the new world, the bringers of the light of vision to a humanity desperate for the vision of an enlightened civilization, one that will be guided by great beings who will embody compassion, love, truth, justice, and alignment with the will of God. And we will serve by bringing the soul into the world, by radiating its inclusive love and compassionate wisdom, 
and by creating the refined environment in which the hierarchy can walk the earth once again. Even now, it seems our task as conscious souls is to find ways of playing the bridging role that will be ours as the new age unfolds. We are privileged and blessed to know that in spite of the appearance of a dying world, higher forces are working out a plan that embodies the divine will to create an entirely new world, one in which the fourth and fifth kingdoms of earth will blend and fuse to create an actual heaven on earth. For now, the question facing us is how to become better communicators of these emerging realities in ways that will, quotes, produce fundamental changes in human thought, awareness, and direction, as DK called us to do long ago. Oh, thank you, Nancy. I think the whole topic of deglamorizing, demystifying is really important and to see it for what it is. Um, when you mention hierarchy, there are many images in people's minds about uh, what is hierarchy. And I go back to a dear friend of mine, Donald Keyes, who was the founder of Planetary Citizens. He called the hierarchy simply postgraduate humans. The, these are the humans who had made it through the classroom, who had learnt the lessons, and the way you graduate is through embodiment. They embodied the quality of the soul. And I was thinking about all the talk that goes on in our circles about how do you prepare the way for the externalization and the reappearance. And for me, based on what you've just said, it's a very simple process. The externalization has to begin with a process of internalization. Each of us has to internalize and embody the qualities of the soul. Therefore, we become co-resonant with that kingdom. And therefore, we gain rightful entry into it, not as some sort of privileged club, but as a workplace. And I think <laughs> that's, the, that's the difference. Um, humanity, as you described, is this link between the upper and the lower uh, kingdoms. It's, we're needed as the hands and feet of hierarchy in time and space. And, and I was, had this image, as you were speaking, of this a angel, this deva with this creative vision in mind, beaming this wonderful thought onto a block of marble, and nothing happened. But as soon as the inspiration was beamed to a being called a Michelangelo, Michelangelo went, oh, just a minute, mm -hmm. um, saw the marble, started chipping away, and revealed the beauty that was inside that f block of marble, and what ended up was a correspondence on the outside of the beauty that was on the inside, the truth and the beauty and the goodness. And in the same way, I think, the beauty of the divine plan can only be revealed and made manifest when the human genius is able to capture the dream, uh, which we call the divine plan, and we can express it in new ways of living, new ways of being together. So. For me, cooperation with the spiritual hierarchy is not an academic research project or an esoteric study group. <laughs> it's a practical necessity. It's what we need to do each day, each moment. It is our task. It is what happens when we fully respond to the call of the soul. Yes, I agree with everything you've said, Michael. And your image of working with... Uh with stone and, and sculpting it brought to mind the um, the idea of Vladimir Solovyov, a great Russian philosopher from the 19th century, who said that the real importance of love between two people he was talking about is that the love the lover perceives in the beloved the perfect image of that person and, and by perceiving it, by holding that image, allows the beloved to try to fulfill that, that image, that, that potential. And I think as a group, one great way that we can serve each other is to actually begin to see each other through the eyes of the soul, through the eyes of love, 
and the light of the soul and to put everything into perspective about the other, the others, so that the inner qualities become much more important than the outer qualities and that we consciously all begin to um, help to ignite those inner qualities and keep them alive more and more of the time. All of us, I'm sure, have had the inner experience of the soul, knowing what it is to be one with life and one with that sense of that great sense of unity where there are no boundaries and barriers and where love just flows. But then we come back into the world and it's it's not frequent to find people who can help us to sustain that. But I think one of the main aspects of the work of the group could be to keep that in mind, to sustain that in each other, to hold everyone mm -hmm. in that loving aura. Thank you. And, and, and to go back to your point about what are the glamours and illusions and sort of taboos that uh, surround the whole notion of co cooperation with spiritual hierarchy, I think we've all bumped into them in, in ourselves and in others. Um, I'm, I was introduced to that phrase, I'm sure we're all familiar with, those that know don't say and those that say don't know, which sort of means that you keep quiet. Well, there is a place for occult silence which safeguards an idea or safeguards something that should not be revealed at this moment. And yet there is another part of us that needs to own who we are and own the connection that we have with, with, with truth. And it's a very fine line because it, if it comes from my ego, then I'm using that declaration to bolster my own self-image and, and it becomes something around my need for recognition or it aggrandizes my personality. However, to the degree that I am decentralized as a person and living to some degree as a soul, then it's very natural. And I have to be careful what I say and when I say it, but if I truly feel that I've been inspired, there's a, that, that's a prompting that I had truly came from an inner source that I may call the spiritual ashram or my elder brothers and sisters, then um, in the right setting, I will say that and own it. And if I am deluded, I will <laughs> find out later. But I think it's time to own this stuff not to use it as a way of bolstering up our own image within some esoteric community, but a way of just saying, hey, this is what's going on. Um, there are many times when, I'll give you an example, Nancy. Um, if I'm sitting in, in a room or in a conference, uh, occasionally I get this feeling come over me, uh oh, I've got to say something. And I find myself going, standing up or, or if I'm in a smaller circle, I just find myself speaking um, and saying something that needs to be said in the moment. And then it goes away. And whether that is something that I am bringing through because it's needed to be placed in the field uh, uh, from some sort of hierarchical impression or whether it's from my soul, it doesn't really matter. The thing is, I'm being responsive to an inner call and daring to do that. Now, other times where I say things where it's Michael speaking, <laughs> and I, I just create a lot of noise. So, but I, there are definite times when I, I feel guided and I'm sure all of us gathered today know those times when we do and say things that really um, are gifts and contributions and selfless. And I think, um, to go back to the mantra of the, of the new group of world servers that Alexander read in the beginning, the, the, the three words that, um, that DK gave us through self-forgetfulness, harmlessness, and right speech, those, if we could just follow those guidelines our, through our lives, that would place our feet firmly on the path of, of, of service and discipleship. So how do we, how do, we do right speech? Hmm. around cooperation and and uh, cl closer partnership with, with the spiritual hierarchy. So what are some of the things you've bumped into, Nancy, that are the taboos? Well, <laughs> that's a big question. And uh, I'd say a lot because I've, uh, my life has been such that I've, I've had a lot of inner experiences and I discovered early on, on 
the way uh, during the, the period of life that I began to have these experiences that it wasn't um, it wasn't appropriate to talk about them because other people would um, judge them or see them in a light that was not favorable. You know, all the things that we've talked about having to do with glamour and illusion and and things like that. And um, so, along with that, part of the path is to learn to withdraw from um, personality relationships where those things can be distorted and to live from within from within more and more and so along the way you learn what is occult silence and you learn that many things that you are experiencing cannot be shared but then there comes a time and I think this is that time when it's necessary to share with others that the hierarchy is looking for co-workers <laughs> down here among us and that um, the more we move in that direction and the more we sense that it is an, an honest to goodness you know solid relationship that we can rely on it's been tested for years we know that um, uh, there are fewer glamours and illusions and there may once have been about it then I think it's time to begin to, for us to begin to build those bridges hmm. outwardly hmm. you know through things that we share with one another um, it seems that this is one of those times when we're being called to do that more and more right uh, and you mentioned the word distortion and I think what has happened with several of the words we use there's been a distortion of the concept of hierarchy. Um, I know particularly within the business world and within social settings, hierarchy is a bad word now. <laughs> People say, oh, hierarchy is old, it's dead, there's a new way, it, it, it's flat organizations, there's, group de there's democracy, etc., etc. Because people have misunderstood hierarchy based on their fear of being controlled by others. Mm. And quite rightly so. Uh, the power has been misused in the human kingdom to, where one person seeks to control another or a group of, of others or a nation or a world. And I think that when people realize that the hierarchy is a hierarchy of love, it's an embodiment of love, it's part of this great chain of being, then really what we're doing is we are seeking to embody love and we're being guided and encouraged and supported by those who have embodied a greater state of love. Therefore, it, it, is, it is not a control or an, or an imprisonment. And as we know, the hierarchy can only suggest and encourage and wait until we choose to be in partnership with them because they honor the, the great Syrian law of freedom. Mm -hmm. And all we, all us Star Trek fans know <laughs> the, 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 the number one rule, you don't interfere in another, in another um, civilization by imposing <laughs> your, own, <laughs> your own rules. So when humanity can say, Father, not my will but thine, when we can consciously choose to cooperate with something greater than ourselves, then the whole thing can be mobilized. So first of all, we have to liberate ourselves from the fear so that we can join together with the spiritual hierarchy and mobilize the forces here on earth. We are the revealers. We are the mobilizers. And if we don't get our act together, the plan's not going to happen. Mm, so so there's one example of distortion. And just, just one other example of distortion, I'm thinking now amongst our esoteric community, when we use the word astral. Um, often when somebody says it's astral, it usually has a negative con connotation. But, but in fact, the astral plane is, is, a, is a plane of existence of the planetary logos. It is a, a field. It has a beautiful light and sensitivity. The astral light has a very special gift and quality of illumination. However, because humanity is mainly polarized on, on this astral plane, we have polluted it. We've polluted it with our negative thoughts and feelings, just in the same way we've polluted the oceans and the rivers with our toxic waste. So the astral plane needs cleaning up. 
and we need to redeem that. So th there are people who are consciously working to clean up the astral subplanes, working with devas, etc. But what we have to realize is that some of the words we use, um, they have a purer meaning, but they've been distorted by our own impurities, our impure thinking as a species, and so we have to redeem them. Hierarchy is one of them. And I just use the illustration of astral because I think it's important for us as, as the new group of world servers to realize that part of our work is cleaning up the astral. You know, this is the great recycling event of the, of, 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 of the century. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it's now um, be a good time to open uh, our uh, floor for the audience. And if anyone would like to share their impressions or comments or maybe the question, you can do that by raising your hand. It's a special uh, button in your control panel and we will unmute you. Uh, for technical reason, all the attendees are muted now, but we uh, really encourage you and welcome to join the conversation. And also you can um, put your comment or question via the chat uh, box in your control panel. Usually it takes a few minutes before people get really uh, grab into the asking questions to share their comments. So please, if you have any uh, other ideas you want to share, Michael or Nancy, please. No, I think it's important that we have a conversation as best we can amongst everyone gathered. I, uh, I think there are like 68 people around the world on this call. And therefore, that is an incredible confluence of spiritual force. And part of what we're seeking to do is how do we liberate and mobilize this spiritual force? So we all need to participate in this conversation, whether we speak or ask a question or not. The real thing is, what does it mean for us to be living disciples? What does it mean to us to respond to the plan? What does it mean to us to respond to the call of the soul? That's what we're exploring together, not just for our own self-development, but really to help manifest the divine plan, or the, what I would call the, the deep desire of Sanat Kumara. Um, I've unmuted Christine Moore, uh, but Christine, you muted yourself. So yes, now you can speak. Hello, Christine. Yes, hello. Uh, this discussion and the writings this month were especially wonderful. I will begin by asking if we can access the first two publications that were made, since this is reflecting the third. And um, I have just recently attended a Theosophical meeting where we discussed the Mahatma letters. And the discussion was that the brothers do not want us to revere them. And my question to that speaker was, tell us what it takes to become a great soul. And that is a very humbling journey. So anyone who thinks that we are talking about a hierarchy really needs to understand the path. Hmm. Your comment? Oh, th thank you. I think that's part of the Mahatma letters. I love that book. <laughs> I just. It's wonderful. And all, all the problems that, that the early Theosophical Society got into because it not truly understanding what is right relationship between the fourth and the fifth kingdom. And until, until we understand, as you say, what it means to tread the path, c contact with the, with the and c communication with the spiritual hierarchy is a result of treading the path. It's not the goal itself. It's an effect. Once we commit ourselves to, to serve the common good, to serve a higher purpose, to serve the plan, then we naturally are brought into partnership with those who are tasked with, 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 with the plan. So it's, it's how do you keep this in right proportion? And I think the Tibetan talked about approaching this with humility. And humility was an adjusted sense of right proportion, which means we don't under inflate ourselves and we don't over inflate ourselves. 
we get it just right. It's it, the right proportion, right perspective, so that we um, we own we own the truth of who we are, but we don't aggrandize it in order to be self-serving. We own the truth of who we are in order to serve others. Right, and I would just add to that that uh, the further we go on the path, the more humbling the path becomes because we see how much lies before us. We see the qualities that we don't yet have that would enable us to be available for greater service. We see our limitations compared to the ones who really really have achieved, the great ones. So uh, it's a very humbling process and as I tried to say earlier, it's a very de-glamorizing process because the truth of it is that we all have issues that we have to face, that we don't want to face, but that we have to in order to liberate the spiritual resources within us. And so um, if we're honestly treading the path, there's a lot to make us feel very humble and to see ourselves in right proportion to the, to the elder brothers, to the hierarchy, to the the ashram of the particular ashram and the greater ashram of which um, we may be a part. I've unmuted Uta. Hi Uta. Hi Uta. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I would like to say thank you to Nancy and Michael for having the courage to address this very vital issue that is not so much not easy uh, bring so much unease in the esoteric community and we really have to face this now and overcome it now and the, the ideas that you have brought are so helpful for it. Uh, I want to underline two things here. Nancy, you uh, mentioned briefly um, something like honoring our own experience. If we are um, if we have these experiences, and we all have them, as Michael also has uh, uh, described, if we honor these, if we honor them more than, than the theories that we know so well from the books, then we have a chance to, um, to come from a place of truth, our own truth, and uh, to dare to... to Yes, to honor it, to respect it, to believe in it, to give it a chance and uh, to dare to share them, uh, then we become uh, scientific, you know, empirical at least, you know, towards scientific. And I think uh, uh, now that we are entering the Aquarian age, we are helped by this, by, um, by this fifth ray coming in and uh, helping us once we share our experience we can uh, have a chance then to see the lawfulness that underlies it and we can only see it if we share it you know if we compare our our experiences so we become scientists and this is actually a safe way to go if it is combined of course with an open heart Thank you so much, Uta. It's so good to hear your voice, and I so appreciate what you have said. And the key word for me in what you said was a place of truth. If we're sharing from a place of truth and based on experience, it can only lead to good. Because um, especially if we understand that we're, we're part of a great experiment where for the first time humanity um, more than one, more than one great soul at a time, is learning how to communicate with the subtle realms. It's the first time that many of us are doing this together, and aware of doing this together. And, and I think one of the taboos um, that has existed and prevented our sharing has to do with uh, maybe a fear that people are not speaking from their truth; they're making things up. Uh, you know, they're trying to glamorize their lives or aggrandize themselves. But mm -hmm. if we speak from that place of truth um, that has been proven to us, you know, over the years, I think it can really only lead to the good. So thank you so much for, for mm -hmm. mentioning that. 
Thank you, Uta. Um, I'd like to share my impressions on this. And I think that when hierarchy inspires um, workers on this physical plane, they don't actually look for ownership of that inspiration or any truth. They're looking for those workers who can actually appropriate that truth and talk exactly as we say that from the inner place of truth and appropriate meaning to take responsibility for that truth and start to become a voice of that truth and not just the voice but to live that truth and therefore i think in this conversation of deglamorization for me the main thing it's not the uh where the certain truths coming from but either you are ready or not to take responsibility to manifest that truth to embody that truth and so mm -hmm. therefore when you start talking about some high um, ideas even the way you talk it's it's important appropriation to truth it's meaning to talk it's in your own words and uh that's in my experience that's been one of the biggest challenges when i talk to my friends about the hierarchy and the christ to try to talk it the way how like normal people speak not with our esoteric uh, ergo but uh, the way that it would be clear but still would communicate the meaning the essence of what is the, the hierarchy as michael said it's uh, postgraduate humanity it's beautiful <laughs> beautiful mm -hmm. metaphor how to talk about it and if we, we could find our own way to express and appropriate those truths and express through own uh, system of symbols clear for us and to our peers then i think that's what the hierarchy wants us to do yes i totally agree and i would like to emphasize the word embody. I think that's the key because when we begin to embody these qualities, these truths, then uh, we can begin to talk about them with greater ease. Yeah. Uh, I've unmuted Susan McNeil. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy and Michael. That was just a beautiful, inspiring conversation. And it really felt like the heart of the group in, was embodied and emerged. And it just seems like the masters in the past, they used the individual disciples to bring forth the teaching. And what's so essential now, and you were talking about this and emphasizing it, Nancy, is that it's the group endeavor. And that's what you and Michael, I think, just demonstrated, the group energy. And that's what, you know, we're, we're meeting them on that plane at this time. So, again, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. And the other thing we're doing is we we talk in terms of raising earth to heaven and bringing heaven down on earth. When we mention raising earth to heaven, we are actually changing the atomic structure of our vehicles. We are actually creating a higher order frequency of atoms in our bodies. And that's what creates the light body. We're told that's what saints, they, they exude light. They give off perfumes and... and uh, and light, that's what happens when the energy is released within the atom, when it's vibrating at a higher frequency. So that's what we're destined to do. We're tr destined to become not just messengers of light, but revealers and embodiers mm. of light. And, and light is simply the manifestation of, of that impulse of love that's seeking to come through here in time and space. But I'm just thinking that that's, that's what we're being asked to do is bring heaven down on earth and raise um, earth up to heaven <laughs> and therefore it's a dual action it's like a to uh, the toroidal movement of heaven and earth interacting through the human heart 
And I think um, that's really important, Susan, when you said uh, the human heart. For me, the heart is the portal to the cosmos. It's the portal to everything. When I was working as a gardener um, at Fendhorn, we'd have a lot of people come through and say, well, I'd like to see the fairies, I'd like to see the devas, and, and, you, and you think, well, how do I respond to this? And it's not a question of straining your eyes, it's a question of opening your heart and actually feeling love for the beauty that you see before you in the garden. And what is revealed to you is beauty. Behind that beauty, there are creative forces. So first of all, be inspired by the beauty. And then that opens up through the heart communication with the creative forces that have actually helped to reveal this beauty. And the same with the hierarchy. It's not a question of sitting down and trying listening to a disembodied voice from a master. It's how do I create a bridge of resonance between my soul and the kingdom of souls? How do I create a bridge of love? Because that is how we enter. It's enter through an act of love and enter through an act of will. As Nancy said, it's an act of sacrifice. And the act of sacrifice is willfully, in the highest sense of the word, willfully, willfully expressing love by giving of oneself to others. <laughs> I've unmuted Maria Cristina Donadieu. Maria Cristina. Jean, how wonderful to be here together. That was incredibly beautiful, Michael. It's a little hard to follow up, but... Um, even starting from the very first reading as that we are now meeting as personalities and as souls um, from that first Diana one quote I think that is exactly what we are doing here together now um, that this in itself our meeting in this way is an externalization thank you Sasha Hierarchy itself means revealer of the sacred, which just ties in so beautifully with um, coming from your own inner knowings, um, standing in those and giving externalization to that, which, as we know, is very difficult in this our daily lives because of what the group humanity we are a part of and even as we try and work we we see ourselves you know we confront our own illusions and glamours <laughs> which gives a wonderful opportunity for growth and dedicating it to the overall quota of what is happening now on our planet I would like to share that some of you know and some of you will not that here in Tucson unit of service has been meeting for over eight years now working with the dissipation of glamour meditation work from glamour the glamour book and I think it is key that we no, don't take ourselves too seriously at the same time <laughs> absolutely you know, you take the work seriously, but, you know, you ride lightly in the saddle, I think, at one time, I recall reading. Two I, I think, yeah, I think, things I want to add. Go ahead, Michael. No, no, I was just thanking you, for because not taking ourselves too seriously, it, when I was at Findhorn, every Friday evening we would have a meeting of the community and we would sing songs and we would tell stories, but we'd also have something called a skit gang, which was a parody. We would make fun of ourselves if we were taking ourselves too seriously. So somebody would do this skit or this enactment of a meditation competition. Who could meditate better than somebody else? And so we would just keep it in proportion. So because if you take yourselves too seriously, you become brittle and you break but you've got to become fluid and agile and light. So thank you. I think that's a really important point you make. And by the way, I have to add, it was wonderful to hear Donald Keyes mentioned. <clears throat> I was part of that planetary initiative years ago, 
Yes. And um, was in a workshop with him, and what a joy to hear his name. Thank you. And th I will have just wanted to share a quote that has continued to be with me since for the last since I first started a few decades ago, <laughs> 40, 50, and that is in terms of embodying that externalization as much as possible. Um, if your awareness of being is of a personality nature, Dina one, so will be your activity. I would have you remember that right doing is a result of being. If your consciousness is focused in spiritual being, your spontaneous, creative, and active service will be consequently by radiation. Mm -hmm. No matter does what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question uh, from G uh, Jean Bates. Uh, she, uh, she asked Michael if you remember the quote from the David Spangler about "Come forth, you builders, and build the new heaven and the new earth." If you do, please share it with us. Thank you, and bravo to you and Nancy. Very beautiful and practical sharing. Thank you. No, I, I Jean, I don't remember the actual quote. It sounds like one of the songs that the New Troubadours sang at Finhorn, and David Spangler was part of this group, New Troubadours. But I do remember what what David Spangler said about the hierarchy, which goes back to what M Maria Christina's just said about taking ourselves lightly. He said that the the masters were laughter incarnate. He he just said that it was just a, a pure a sense of just pure joy. So. The whole idea of not taking ourselves seriously, the work is serious, but it's done in the realm of the soul, which is pure joy. And I, I, I think that and the other thing that David Spangler said, which I think is incredibly important, he said, our task is to be divinely ordinary. That means to bring heaven and earth together inside ourselves in a very real way each day in everything that we think, we say and we do. And back in the 70s, he coined this phrase and sort of asked us at Fenhorn, you know, consider being divinely ordinary. There is a um, comment from uh, Maria Caligari. Thank you so much for this beautiful group experience. Just a thought. Are we not working as the group of souls today together, creating that center where we can know the will of God? Thank you, Maria. Um, For some reason, um, Nancy was uh, muted. I, I apologize if I did it. Uh, if you had any comment to that, because our panelists yes, are al just... always unmuted, and for some reason you got muted. Sorry. Oh, sorry. That was um, not intentional. Okay, I just wanted to thank Maria and to say yes. I think that doing what you, exactly what you said is the learning for our time. I think that that's how we will become an effective force resource and force and serving the hierarchy together. Exactly that. And uh, I'm on mute Katya. Katya? Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm unmuted. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> hello, Katya. Um, I just, you know, I was listening to you about the um, point of seriousness, and uh, I just remembered the phrase. I'm not sure who said that. I think it's somewhere from Tibetan that uh, only the soul actually laughs because personality is always very serious. <laughs> And um, so even I think when we say we take the word the work seriously, 
I just remembered my uh, stepson's phrase. You know, he keeps saying he's a teenager. He's, a, I'll take to it personally. He says, <laughs> I'll see to it personally. <laughs> yeah. Um, that means butt out and don't even come close. I think that the group work really switches from seriousness to true creativity. Yes. And uh, this the sensation of actually live happening. That is the living discipleship that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the presence of the heart and the presence of the actual process of creation. As at the moment, as Maria said, you know, at the moment, at this particular moment, <laughs> the group soul is at work, precipitating whatever each of us needs, you know, in our individual service and at the same time whatever is needed for the group to reach the next goal I don't know but um, yeah so I, w I would I would remove the word serious altogether <laughs> uh, that's a serious yes. suggestion I'll see to it personally <laughs> <laughs> but what, what it what it does for me um, it, it makes me think that what I'm saying is not so much serious is serious. What I'm saying is I will take responsibility. I think that's yes. what I'm saying. And when Thank the, you. That, that, when that. the soul takes responsibility, it does it joyfully. I think that that's so thank you. That that's a very useful reframing because often we get stuck in being serious. And in the Agni Yoga teachings it talks about solemnity all the time that you have to approach it was solemnity and I recently was in a, a study group in, in Italy um, for the Agni Yoga teachings and somebody says what is solemnity and people were exploring this and we said it doesn't mean keeping a long straight face solemnity means actually taking responsibility and honoring the truth of that which is calling to us but we do it lightheartedly and we do it joyfully so we have to remove these old sixth form distortion, six uh, yeah, no, six ray distortions of 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 the devotional path that where you have to be solemn and not say a word. No, you have to be connected, committed, and joyfully active. That's what we're saying now, and this is what we're doing together. And the other thing you said, uh, the, the word precipitation. For me. We're here to precipitate the future together, not just clean up the past. We have to clean up what we've created, the mess, the pollution. However, we have another task, which is the creating of a new civilization, the precipitation of the future. And that is our task. We have a twofold task. Thank you very much, Michael. I think time-wise, it's it's a good moment for us to go uh, towards meditation. And just uh, before we go there, I want to mention that uh, Riza Dangelis found a quote and shared with us. And so I placed it in the chat window from David Spangler. And uh, oh, fantastic! Yes. Yeah, and also uh, Jan Palko asked about that uh, quote that was on the screen earlier uh, from uh, Dinah. Uh, we will post that quote on the, our website together with the archived recording of this webinar. So it's uh, 2025initiative.org, so it will be there. And I can just mention that it's pages uh, page uh, 707, Dinah 1, so if you want to go there and find yourself before that, before it will be on our website. Yes, Michael. No, I think, it, as you say, it's time to move in. Do we have 15 more minutes? Because I know Nancy wanted to take us through something. And then I thought we could close because we're on the first day of the five-day uh, approach of the Festival of Humanity, the Gemini Full Moon. And it would be wonderful to utilize the energy of this group to prepare the field for the festival. So there are two activities we can do. And so I'm just checking with Nancy. Can we do this in 15 minutes or let's do it. Let's do it in 15 minutes if that's how long we have. What do you think, Nancy? 
Is, is she unmuted, Alexander? Yes, Nancy is unmuted, but for some reason we can't hear her. So I'm not sure. Okay, um, well. prob probably there's some problems with the audio. Uh, yes, Nancy unmuted, but we can't hear her. So maybe you can just take a responsibility of doing what your soul communicates to you is the right thing to do at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think what I'd like Hello? to do is... Hello? Hi oh, there. Michael? Nancy. Yes. Oh, okay. We, we, I don't Before know what happened, but something got disconnected again. I yeah. Ah, so that, ha that ha happens on in time and space occasions. Yes, it does. <laughs> as long as we stay connected on the inner realms, we're fine. Sasha, how much time do we have? Actually, we now? have 14 minutes, Nancy. That was the question. No, you is, is that is that really what we have? Well, Sasha, we, or can we go over? No, we we can go over, and if anyone would uh, has the necessity to leave early, anyone can do that. So, but yeah, we we are flexible. We're not rigid. Okay. <laughs> in our good. Yes. Okay. Well, let me. Um, I. I there's something that I, I created for us to go through together and to try to experience inwardly um, what the chain of consciousness really is that links humanity and hierarchy. So if we could um, spend a little time on that, I'll, I'll go through it more quickly than I had planned, but I'll try to do it in a way that still leaves some time for, for contemplation because that's what this was intended to be. So. Um, so let me begin, let us begin by closing our eyes and taking three deep breaths. And trying to release all the present content of our minds. First, let us try to get in touch with the soul on its own plane. The part of ourselves that loves unconditionally because it is love by nature. It loves all of life without boundaries or limitations, just as the sun shines on all living beings. And now, let's get in touch with the aspect of the soul that is light, that is wisdom and discernment, and that can access the plane of buddhi, of pure intuition or direct knowing. Allow yourself to imagine for a moment the pure joy of the soul that loves all and knows its oneness with all and realizes that it is serving the whole in some way. As the heart expands into the unbounded unity of life, allow the mantle of grace to descend upon you, filling you with indescribable peace and joy. And now, feeling identified with the soul and utilizing all of its potentials, turn the searchlight of the soul toward the persona, the mask being worn by the soul in this lifetime. And peering behind the mask, Try to see what is still blocking the full expression of the higher self and the places where the sense of separation still remains. And ask the soul to reveal the steps you can take to dissolve the sense of separation. And now again, seeing yourself as one with the soul, 
fully identified with it. Ask yourself what it would take for you to live as a soul. What would enable your personality to surrender completely to the solar angel as the guide and director of your life? leading you closer to the hierarchy and to the pure light of and pure light and love of the divine presence returning to the outer plane for a moment think about someone in your life who is further along on the path than you are What are the outstanding qualities of this person and how is this person serving the humanity and the plan? What are the attributes that they have that you would like to reveal through your own soul? And now Try to envision a living saint or a master on the inner planes. What attributes do they have? We know that masters of wisdom are individuals who have perfected, or as Michael said, graduated from <laughs> the whole gamut of human experience. But take a moment to assimilate the idea that they once were human and that they entered the fifth kingdom by exactly the same path that many of us are now treading. Having released all human attachments and proclivities, they exist only to carry out the purposes of God. As custodians of the plan, their field of service entails helping every pilgrim on the path to reach a stage of awareness where we, all of us, can cooperate consciously with them. Their aim is to aid and encourage all who set foot on the discipleship path to become active links in the living chain of hierarchy that will enable the divine plan to manifest on earth. Take a moment to contemplate the next step on this path for you. What obstacle or obstacles do you need to overcome in order to proceed on the way towards self-perfection? And how will your service to the plan and to humanity and the hierarchy expand as a result? And finally, what help do you need in this process? Envision yourself actually calling upon your solar angel and upon your inner guides and teachers to help you in taking this next step. And know in the depths of your soul that the laws of invocation and evocation or call and response are actual laws which guarantee that we will receive this help. Keeping in mind that the entire goal of the hierarchy at this point or one of the main goals is to enable us to become co-workers with them and with the plan. Thank you.
Thank you, Nancy. So just keeping this reflective space, let's be aware that this is day one of the five-day festival of humanity, the full moon of June. And we know that the esoteric mantra for Gemini is, I recognize my other self, and in the waning of that self, I glow and grow. And this is what we're doing together. We're glowing and growing together in service of the plan. And if I could just, before we go into a meditation, just read two short paragraphs on the Festival of Humanity, just to provide some focus. The full moon of June is recognized as that of the Christ, just as the full moon of May is that of the Buddha. It has long been a legend, and who shall say that it is not a fact, that at each full moon of June, Christ gives again the last sermon of the Buddha, thus linking the full enlightenment, enlightenment of the pre-Christian era and the wisdom of the Buddha to the cycle of the distribution of the energy of love for which Christ is responsible. On this festival for 2,000 years, the Christ has represented humanity and has stood before the hierarchy and in the sight of Shambhala as the God-man, the leader of his people and the eldest in a great family of brothers and sisters. This is, therefore, a festival of deep invocation and appeal, of a basic spiritual aspiration towards fellowship, of human and spiritual unity, and represents the effect in the human consciousness of the work of the Buddha and the Christ. It is known also as the festival of unification or the festival of goodwill. So with that in mind and with that in heart, let us visualize ourselves here today around the planet, forming this chalice of receptivity. And from the heart of our group, we send a beam of love down into the heart of the earth and into the heart of the mother of the world, expressing our gratitude for her sustaining love and nourishment. And from the heart of our group, we send a beam of light into the heart of hierarchy into the heart of Christ and stand with the Christ in the fire of love. And together we send a beam of love into the heart of Shambhala, the center of true peace and standing with as an aspect of the planetary life. We connect with the heart of the sun and the loving purpose of the solar logos. And we allow the love that flows from the heart of God to flow through all of creation and we hold all of this within the heart of our group as we prepare for the festival of humanity. So in the silence now, let us hold and let us see the united gifts of the Christ and the Buddha and let us see humanity taking those gifts and acting upon them in service of the divine plan.
and we bring ourselves to a point of focus and through the power and rhythm of the great invocation we call upon the spiritual forces and let us pause after each stanza of the great invocation to visualize that which we are calling forth from the point of light within the mind of God let light stream forth into the minds of men let light descend on earth from the point of love within the heart of God let love stream forth into the hearts of men may Christ return to earth From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells let light and love and power restore the plan on earth And let's just bring ourselves back and conclude by giving thanks to each other for the joy of companionship on the path and for the task ahead of us and for the joy of doing this together of being in service and responding to the call of living discipleship Namaskar. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, yes. yes. For the great joy, joy, I think we're beginning to experience the reality of living discipleship and what it is we can do together when we mobilize our resources together toward a shared goal. And thank you, Sasha, for offering this opportunity for us to share some of these thoughts with the group and be together with the group in this way. Many, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for this work together. And ahead of us, it's, it's the month of distribution as we will go towards the new moon and then to Cancer, the time of manifestation. And now, I, as usual, I want to announce uh, our next webinar. And this time, it's not one webinar. It's uh, three webinars that I would like to announce. Um, this month we're going to have the new moon webinar and uh, it's going to be our experiment 
along the lines of our experiment with cyclic meditation. Uh, those of you who join this experiment of unanimous simultaneous meditation, uh, meditating each month on the seed thought related to the light. This month we will start together and inaugurate this. Uh, the next month we will start together the new seed thought and we will have a new moon webinar on June 18th. It will be a different format of the webinar. It will be a shorter webinar. It's altogether like 45 minutes. As usual, it's experiment, so we're taking it light, riding light in a saddle. Is that right? And we'll see how it will go, and we'll modify our work according to the results. Then on June 21st, we invite you to join our Solstice Festival webinar, and we'll together we'll celebrate this Day of Light, Festival of Light, and we'll meditate, dis distribute it in that light to humanity. And uh, finally, uh, our next solar festival webinar, Kansas Solar Festival webinar, will be on June 30th, and it will be a webinar with Tuya Robbins uh, from Finland, and we will together reflect uh, and meditate on the power and potency of the work of the triangles. And as we now this year, the 2025 initiative focuses, um, brings the focus to the theme of light and bringing in the light. Uh, we see the work of the triangles, the technique of the triangles is one of the most potent practical techniques given by Tibetan to us. And so um, it's, we see importance now in this time of this crisis to give a big emphasis for this topic. And so please join this solar festival webinar in Cancer on June 30th. Thank you very much. And let's stay connected for the next five days of this full moon and ever after. Thank you.